Good evening. Um, I'm Bob Carey. I'm president of the New School, and I welcome all of you here this evening. Uh, this is our, our third uh, panel discussion on the, on the question of immigration. I would say uh, that among the, uh, the important orientations uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this debate, which is still, uh, in, uh, in my view, one of the most contentious debates uh, that the country faces, and the, and the most difficult, because uh, there are determined opponents uh, on both sides of this issue, and a relatively small number of de deter determined opponents can have a significant impact on men and women who um, face the electorate uh, from time to time. And uh, I'm personally very pleased that uh, President Obama has announced that he uh, wants to take this issue on uh, this year, but it will be exceptionally difficult. And it's uh, exceptionally difficult because it's oftentimes uh, true that in these debates, the, the most difficult thing to hear are the facts. And we hope uh, this panel will provide some facts and that it provides some assistance uh, to uh, you as citizens to uh, both form your impressions of what ought to be done and uh, hopefully uh, enable you to prepare and present your arguments more effectively uh, to members of Congress who will be likely deciding uh, this year. I, my own view is if they don't uh, act on it this year, it's going to be exceptionally difficult to do it in 2010. And if they don't do it in 2010, it's exceptionally do it difficult in 2011. And if you don't do it then, it's impossible in 2012. This is the nature of these kinds of things. They tend to get, if they're controversial, they tend uh, to get kicked down uh, the playing field. Uh, we're talking about law. We're talking about U.S. law and what it ought to be. And uh, my, my hope is this evening, both with facts and some examination of current law, uh, 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 we can get a better understanding of what we think the law uh, should be. Uh, uh, the uh, common ground I think that you can find with most uh, uh, people that are, are concerned about this issue is that current law is inadequate. Um, uh, there are some who, uh, uh, unfortunately, one of the panelists uh, that w w was not able to be here is apt to make that argument. Um, um, uh, he was encouraged not to be here by the individuals out on the street. Um, but uh, uh, he's apt to make the argument that all we have to do is enforce current law. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that some of the panelists who have uh, ben with him, another panel, can maybe present his views so that you can get, at least get that, that view in this debate and understand what is being said. I, I, I said to the panelists earlier that if this was a panel that was uh, 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 being held, let's say, in Lexington, Nebraska, which I know relatively well, there would be people on the street protesting their views, <laughs> likely. So uh, uh, oftentimes uh, it is difficult for us to hear uh, a view that's different than ours. And my hope is that somehow in this panel we can begin to, we can put uh, opposing points of view out here so that we can understand the nature of uh, this uh, debate better. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, pleased to, that to, uh, and happy to be able to introduce our panelists who have, in some cases, traveled a fair distance to be here and in all cases uh, have a significant amount of knowledge and a significant amount of experience about uh, this issue. Uh, 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 Jeffrey Purcell is a senior demography with the Pew Hispanic Center. Uh, he is a nationally known expert on immigration to the United States and the demography of racial and ethnic groups. Uh, Mr. Purcell has authored numerous studies on immigrate, uh, immigrant populations in America, uh, and he is obliged uh, to give us facts uh, uh, in his uh, current role and his current sets of responsibilities. So if, if, if in the process of uh, writing out a card a question, uh, uh, you want to direct a question to uh, 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 Mr. Purcell, uh, don't ask him his opinion on immigration. You have to ask him for facts about immigration uh, because he is obliged, as a consequence of uh, 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 his employment status, uh, to present facts, not opinions. Uh, Michael Aitz is the acting deputy director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, prior to that post, he served as associate director of USCIS uh, Domestic Operations Directorate where he was responsible for processing all immigration benefits and services within the United States. And I, uh, I, made, I said to Michael earlier, and I would say to this audience, that uh, a significant number of issues that this university deals with uh, and that I hear about have to do with service, have to do with uh, applications and processing of work, uh, student, visa, applications for green cards, et cetera. I mean, immigration status necessitates a significant amount of service and again, from my experience uh, in, Senate, in, in the Senate, uh, that we have a tendency uh, to make certain that uh, 
uh, it used to be INS, and now it's Immigration, Customs, and Enforcement, uh, gets all the money they need for enforcement, uh, and, uh, um, and after that's done, uh, we give them what little is left over to do the service, and it's a service uh, that, uh, uh, in, in my experience, uh, that people need the most. Uh, uh, Tamar uh, Jacoby is the president and CEO of Immigration Works USA. Uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, Tamar, accurate to say it's a new uh, organization, uh, a national federation working to advance better immigration law. Uh, she's a nationally known journalist and author. She's a leading advocate for immigration reform. Uh, she's the author of Someone Else's House, America's Unfinished Struggle for, Inter for uh, Integration. Uh, Marshall Fitz is the Director of Advocacy for American Immigration Lawyers Association. Uh, 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 this is a national association of over uh, 11,000 attorneys and law professors who practice and teach immigration law. Mr. Fitz uh, heads uh, uh, the Immigration Lawyers Association lobbying and coalition building efforts in furtherance of fair and regional immigration related policies. Uh, and, uh, and perhaps uh, you might ask him a question of um, how that works, how, how, do you, how do you influence members of Congress. Uh, I uh, have my own views on how that should be done, but I, I, it, it's, uh, I think, uh, useful to have somebody here who does this for a living because it's uh, not an easy task. Uh, to co-moderate the question and answer portion of the program, we have Alec uh, Gershberg. Alec uh, is a, a professor uh, at Milano, the New School for Management and Urban Policy. Uh, he's conducted extensive research on immigrant students attending public schools in New York and California. He is a lead author of the recent book, Beyond Bilingual Education, New Immigrants and Public School Policies in California. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, sorry that, that there are two people who are not here that I very much would like to have had here. Ma Mark Kerkorian, uh, uh, the Executive Director of the Center for Immigration Studies, uh, a uh, controversial uh, uh, individual to, to say the least, uh, less, as I said, controversial in certain parts of the country than is here. Uh, but I, I, we invited him, uh, and I regret that he was ill and not able to come, uh, uh, because I, I think it's very important in these debates to get uh, all points of view expressed. Uh, Professor Ari Zolberg was also unable to come. Uh, Professor Zolberg is, a, is an expert on the larger question of migration across the planet. Uh, and in, in, in my uh, uh, view, uh, the issue of immigration is the flip side of the issue of migration. And what Professor Zoberg about two years ago uh, published a new book on, on migration. He's, he's one of the leading experts on this uh, on this subject. Uh, he presented uh, at a uh, to a, a very distinguished audience, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, where he makes the case that approximately a billion people over the next 25 years are going to be moving from rural to urban areas across the planet. So it's creating uh, serious points of conflict in China, in India, and elsewhere uh, 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 on this globe. And uh, for the United States to wrestle with this problem and to resolve it in some uh, uh, meaningful way, I think is an important leadership for, uh, for us in the, in the, in the world. Uh, I'm going to turn this over, uh, uh, Jeff, to you to start. Uh, and as I turn it over to you, I'm now going to move and sit next to you and be silent as possible until the rest of the panel talks. Uh, well, thank you. Is this on? Thank you very much. Uh, I work at the Pew Hispanic Center, which uh, it, we describe ourselves as a fact tank, and we uh, don't uh, take positions on policies, so uh, hence the, the, uh, the restrictions. I, I have opinions, but I'm uh, not in a position to give them right now, is, I guess what to say. Um, we're supposed to get, um, what I'm going to, there you go. What I'm going to try to do um, is I, I just point you to, uh, we issued a report last week on called A Portrait of Unauthorized Immigrants, which uh, goes into a fair amount of detail about the uh, undocumented, uh, unauthorized, illegal immigrant population. Uh, I'm going to, I have picked out some material from that uh, that uh, some of it I found surprising. I think a lot of it uh, is uh, contrary to, I guess, the, the established view, and talk a little about some overall trends to try and put uh, this discussion in context. Uh, the first thing to note is that the overall foreign-born immigrant population has essentially stopped growing in the United States, which is something that really hasn't happened 
for uh, close to 40 years. Uh, the overall growth has slowed down and seems to have stopped uh, since about uh, 2007. Uh, the undocumented population, which we estimate at about 11.9 million right now, uh, is, is within our, the precision, our ability to measure it, we have to say it hasn't changed in the last two years. And the number of Mexicans in the United States is not increasing. Uh, that doesn't mean we, don't, we aren't getting new immigrants, and, uh, but we have seen a tremendous drop in the number of new undocumented immigrants coming. There still are some coming, but the numbers are down substantially, and I'll put some, give you some pictures to look at on this. Legal immigration levels remain high. In 2008, we admitted uh, uh, just shy of 1.1 million new uh, immigrants, which is about the same number for the last four or five years. Uh, and the key point here is that from the data I've looked at in the U.S. and in Mexico as well, there's no evidence that the outflows have increased. Uh, and that's contrary to, I think, a lot of uh, perception, a lot of people's opinions. But the data don't suggest that there has been any increase. And I'm going to talk a little uh, about some of the key characteristics of the undocumented population. In particular, that uh, they, it is largely a population of families with children, and talk a little about the spread, and try to do this in 10 minutes. So. Um, we'll go through this. The first thing to note is that the, the uh, unauthorized immigrant population, uh, and there's a typo here, it's 11.9 million, is not, uh, does not make up the majority of the immigrants in the U.S. It's only about 30 percent, only is perhaps the wrong term, it's about 30 percent of the almost 40 million immigrants living in the country. Uh, there's slightly more who came as legal immigrants who have become U.S. citizens, and there's uh, also slightly more who are legal immigrants who have not become U.S. citizens. Uh, in addition, there's probably a million and a half people here on temporary work visas who are, are living here, uh, would be considered U.S. residents. The, the two smallest groups here are the ones that generate the most heat and, uh, and get the most attention in the policy debates. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is, like I said, these are pictures. This is a trend line of monthly data on the size of the foreign-born population. And there are two lines because we had to change the way we measured it once we got the 2000 census. But you can see this is from 1996 through about 2007, kind of steady upward trend with some, some uh, little squiggles in it. What happened in April 2007, though, is the numbers just stopped growing. And uh, my own sense is that this is largely due to undocumented immigration and it's largely economic and I'll try to try to support that as we go through. Uh, this is the Mexican, the recently arrived Mexican population, same thing. The numbers had been growing and growing and growing and then the growth stopped uh, completely. Uh, and, and we haven't really seen anything like this for a long time. Uh, these are estimates of the size of the unauthorized population, and the key points here are that basically from uh, over about a 16-year period from 1990 or even going back a little further than that to about 2006, the numbers had been increasing steadily at about half a million per year net growth. Uh, we reached uh, a little over 11 million in 2005 from uh, a little under 3 million uh, in the late 90s. So very steady growth, uh, half a million a year, lots of people coming and going. And then 2006, 7, and 8, the numbers leveled off at around 12 million. So, and over this four year period, three year period, we saw growth of about 300,000 per year. Um, this is data from Mexico, and Mexico is, Mexicans represent about 60% of the undocumented population, 
a little over 20% of the legal immigrants. So it's the biggest source of both legal and illegal immigration. And hundreds of thousands of people move between the two countries every year. <clears throat> These are data from uh, basically, this is August 06 to August 07. About 900,000 Mexicans uh, moved from Mexico into the United States uh, during that year. Uh, this is from a survey, a, a big government-run survey taken in Mexico. Uh, their, it's their labor survey. But they also showed that there were about 440,000 people who had moved from the U.S. to Mexico uh, during that year. So, you know, like I said, hundreds of thousands of people moving back and forth, a net of about 450,000 added to the U.S. Uh, population by by this movement. Uh, so now we look at 2007-8, and there's about a 25% drop in the number of people moving into the U.S. Uh, this is a flow that turns out to be very sensitive to employment opportunities in the U.S. Uh, about 80% of these people are undocumented, uh, or even more. So they're coming to work and if they can't get jobs, they don't come. So we had uh, a shortage of jobs, uh, a 25 percent drop in movement into the U.S. But roughly the same number of people moved back to Mexico, about 450,000 during that year. So no real significant change. This is within the margin of error of the survey. No change in the flow back to Mexico. Uh, and. But the net is a, a drop of 50% in the, in the net additions to the U.S. population from this flow. Uh, and we've, we see things like this on, with our data for other populations as well. Um, and I'll show you real quickly. This is an attempt to get at year-to-year -year flows, which turns out not to be very easy to do. Uh, but this is, the, this is new arrivals from Mexico coming into the U.S., and you can see they peaked around 2000. Uh, we had a big expansion of the labor market in the late 90s, and we were, uh, this, this is actually, if, if you remember, the sucking sound, but it's going the wrong way, uh, according to Ross Perot. These were sucking jobs into the U.S. We were drawing Mexicans into the U.S. in the late 90s to fill the jobs, the big expansion in the labor market. Uh, the numbers peaked in 2000. In the recession of 2002-03, you can see the numbers dropped substantially. They had started back up by 2004, but the, the latest economic uh, situation seems to have caused a, a further, a fairly dramatic downturn. And there's a line here, it's a little hard to see, but this is the unemployment rate flipped over. This is the employment rate. You can see here how sensitive the flows are to the availability of jobs in the U.S. If jobs are available, people come. If jobs aren't available, people don't come. And, and this is, this is uh, typical of the Mexican flows. This is the Central American flows. We see very similar patterns. And uh, this is South America. The numbers have dropped substantially. Uh, these are all flows that this is principally where the undocumented immigrants come from, these three parts of the world. Uh, we don't see that. Uh, in, in the Caribbean, we see a leveling off, but no big drop. Uh, Asia, we actually see increasing flows from Asia. Uh, and uh, Europe and Canada is, is sort of uh, the last couple of years a downturn, but basically a leveling off. So we, we're, we're seeing responses that differ by the nature of the immigration and the undocumented immigration, which is, is largely economic, uh, has dropped substantially uh, due to the state of the economy. Um, in this report we did on characteristics of the unauthorized population, uh, I was struck uh, by some of the data as we were putting it together. We looked at households where headed by uh, undocumented immigrants, and almost half of them 
were households of couples with children. Uh, in contrast, legal immigrants, about 35 percent, are, are couples with children. In the U.S. native population, it's only about 21 percent. Some of this is age structure. The undocumented population has almost nobody over 40, so you don't get any households with, uh, you get very few households with older couples without children, very few households of single older uh, adults like we see in the native population. Uh, but also because they are young uh, and uh, have fairly high fertility, they're more, much more likely to have kids. Um, the stereotype of the undocumented immigrant, I believe, is the young male here by himself looking, the day laborer here to make some money, may have a wife and kids at home, but um, basically here by himself. The bar on the left represents those men. It's about 2.9 million uh, men here by themselves, no wife, no kids. Uh, you can see that's, that's a minority of the undocumented men. There are 3.3 uh, million men with, uh, with wives, and most of them have kids. The 2.9 million is only about a quarter of the undocumented population. So it, it's, it's, it's a stereotype that has some validity because it's not a small group, but it's certainly not typical of the unauthorized population. If we look at the families with these immigrants, you see here the men and women we just, uh, we just uh, talked about, about 10 million. There are about a million and a half children who are themselves unauthorized immigrants. But the key point here is there's four million kids who are US citizens living in the United States with an undocumented immigrant uh, or two undocumented immigrant parents. And there are almost 17 million people in these families. So to, to close here, I wanna, wanna make one other point about what's happened to, to this issue. In 1990, 42% of the undocumented immigrants were in California and uh, the next five large states had another 40%. Uh, another, uh, and there were about 20% of the undocumented population or about 700,000 in the rest of the country. Today, there's 42% in the rest of the country. California has 22% now. The other states sort of held their own in percentage terms. California has more. It went from 1.5 million to 2.7 million. But as a share, it's dropped dramatically. But the important thing to note here is that 42% represents almost 5 million undocumented immigrants. So it's taken what had been a regional issue in half a dozen states and moved it out to the rest of the country, which you can see on this map. So just real quick, the flows have slowed overall, uh, but the ma major cause behind that is the big drop in the unauthorized inflow. Uh, that's a response to the economy largely, in my opinion. Uh, we don't know how much of a role enforcement has played. Uh, when the economy turns around, I think we'll see the answer to that, whether the undocumented immigrant flow will pick up or not. Uh, these are families uh, with a lot of kids who are U.S. citizens. The numbers are very big, which complicates the political issue, and it's, it's dispersed around the country, so it's something that affects uh, all parts of the country now instead of just half a dozen states. So thank you very much. And As he introduced us, President Kerry hypothesized that there's a fundamental need for change in immigration in this country. Um, as Someone from USCIS, I'm not here to challenge or disagree with that statement. The issue becomes how we implement change. 
and which direction it goes. Unlike in a parliamentary model, where executive agencies may actually write legislation that gets introduced and passed by uh, a parliament, in this country, we rarely, as executive agencies, actually author legislation. Our role in the process is more, our job in the process is more one of trying to make sure that the strategic policy objectives that the White House and Congress set can be successfully implemented. It doesn't mean that we're absolutely silent. It does mean that we offer and often um, uh, Congress and the White House use our ideas as to how to give them a best sense of how a program can be designed and executed so that it can succeed and meet their strategic goals. Now, I haven't heard anyone argue that the only thing to be solved is the issue of 11.9 million people. Uh, you don't want to simply restart the cycle all over again. I was with uh, what was then INS in 1986 when we went through this process for about three million people, and here we are uh, today. So you're probably looking at a more comprehensive solution. But let's focus on the 11.9 and the problem that that represents, and frankly, the challenge that that represents to us, because we will be the agency that will you know, predominantly be tasked with dealing with uh, the demand for services from these folks as they apply for any type of program that Congress should pass. Think of it in terms of scale, for example. We typically process about six million applications a year. You're now talking about introducing another 11.9 million folks into that uh, scheme. And those 11.9 million folks, depending on how legislation is drafted, may not each file one application. So we, we are challenged in order to be able to grow and be able to deal with that volume quickly. And from our perspective, speed will be essential. If you design a program where you have lots of initial requirements, you have to get lots of documentation to prove you were here for X number of years, you have to pay substantial fines up front you have to go back home again and touch base. All of those complexities mean applicants will need an extended period of time in which to file an application. An extended period of time creates its own series of issues because while the windows are open for them to file, other folks are entering the United States alleging they've been here all along so that they too can be able to claim benefits under a program like this. So you've got scale and you've got the need for speed. And speed not only in terms of a filing process, but speed in terms of the need to be able to provide service and a decision to these individuals. Because they will, if there is a program, be coming out of the shadows looking to be able to regularize their status. And again, that's where the structure of the program becomes so important. Because if a program chooses to look backwards, lots of documentation, for example. Well, in 86, we got lots of documentation. Today, imagine what kind of documentation people would be able to manufacture uh, over the web. Uh, our ability to be able to validate that documentation, the more documentation require, probably the less validity there'll be to a program of this nature. The more upfront requirements that are imposed in terms of the process, the more difficult it will be for those who have to go through it, the more difficult it will be for those who have to administer it and be able to provide service to those individuals. We're going to be challenged to grow very quickly and hopefully challenged to grow before the applications come in the door. Because if you're selling a brand new widget and you expect Christmas sales to be wonderful, you don't start worrying about building the factory and hiring the people to make the widgets after you're inundated with orders. You do that well in advance, you're prepared to deal with the volume. And so you're prepared to provide service to these individuals 
very, very quickly. That's going to require a whole bunch of special authorities that we're going to need in terms of being ex able to expedite procurements, being able to hire the necessary people, uh, being able to put the contracts in place. These are challenges that can be met, but the degree of challenge, my message to you, is that the degree of challenge varies widely depending on how the program is structured. It can be very, very complicated for folks who will be have to go through it. It can be extraordinarily onerous and difficult for us to administer. Or it can be structured in a way that looks more forward in terms of understanding where people are and deciding where and what series of gauntlets, if you will, or what series of fines or what series of measures need to be imposed prospectively as someone is able to earn status. Uh, as folks talk about amnesty, which is a very charged word, you don't necessarily need to think of this only through the paradigm of amnesty. Um, there are other ways that I think in a comprehensive immigration reform two years ago, they talked about a pathway to citizenship. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be directly to that, but it can be a mechanism by which folks can earn residence, understanding that they're here and that they all do are able to offer some contributions to this country and that we will not be able to effectively enforce immigration laws until we deal with the problem of folks who are here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as somebody who has um, spent the last several years in Washington fighting for the reform that, um, that, that, that Mr. Yates was just talking about, it's really nice to be on a panel and hear someone in the government talk about will, not if or, or, or when, but how it will work. Um, it's also nice as somebody who um, spends a lot of time um, in, in, in the legislative process, um, which as you all know is the, the famous old joke about sausage being made, um, a place you don't really want to, a process you don't really want to watch uh, on, an, on an empty stomach. Um, it's nice to have the opportunity to stand back here and think about really what should our immigration policy be in a rational world if we could really design it as it should work rather than those, those compromises they have to make. Um, what do we really want and need in a bill? Um, and I think um, what I'd like to do in my 10 minutes is um, I think it's hard to think about what a remedy should be unless you start with what the diagnosis is. So I'd like to start with a diagnosis of why I think the immigration system is broken and then go on uh, to my remedy. And really if I had to uh, sum it up, my basic answer to why it's broken is that the law isn't keeping up with reality, with the reality of globalization and of the very interlocked and interrelated world we live in today and the possibilities for economic dynamism that come with that interrelated and interlocked world. So step back for a minute, let's think about some of the forces behind the statistical picture that Jeff gave you, the very informative pic statistical picture that Jeff gave you. The flows are much bigger now than they, or, and, or have been, in, when I say now, in the last 30 years than they were, let's say, in the middle of the 20th century. We tend to think of Ellis Island, and then we kind of forget what happened in the middle of the century, and then we know what's happening today. Well, in, in the 1960s, there were only a couple of hundred thousand people coming a year, whereas now, as, as Jeff Jeff pointed out there are about a million and a half coming every year. And that's not an accident. And it's not because a bunch of senators, Senator Kennedy and others, turned on a faucet in 1965. It's because of big demographic and communica communications shifts, both in the United States and in, and in Latin America. Demographic realities, a few, the few key demographic realities. U.S. fertility is slowing. By 2015, 2020, um, we're not going to be replacing our population, and that slowing has been happening for years now. Uh, baby boomers are retiring. In the next, they're going to retire a little less quickly now, but uh, in the next <laughs> five to ten years, 75 million baby boomers are going to drop out of the labor force, and that's 
been happening for a while. Most important, the U.S. population is getting more and more educated. I always say if there's one set of numbers you need to know to understand immigration today, it's that in 1960, half of all American men dropped out of high school and wanted to do unskilled physical work, half. Today, less than 10% of American men drop out of high school and want to do unskilled physical work. But we still need that kind of work done. Meanwhile, there are all sorts of factors happening in developing countries that are sending people out. I'm not going to go into those. But the point is that communications work really well, too. The guy who's working here in New York in a coffee shop takes out his cell phone and he calls his cousin at home in his little village in Mexico and he says, you know, there's not that much work in the coffee shop. I don't advise you to come this year. And somebody else calls from Las Vegas and says, hey, you know, business is booming in Las Vegas. You ought to come here. And that's the reality, the changing shifts in our demography and that this new New world of communications that's producing that dynamic picture that you saw, Jeff's slide, that slide that really captured it, that had the employment rate and had the numbers of immigration going right in sync with the employment rate in the U.S. And it's a dynamic market situation that basically has worked for the U.S. and for our economy low these past 20, 30 years. Uh, at the, it works at the high end. People come to do jobs at the high end because we don't produce enough doctors and engineers and, and, and PhD scientists. About 25% of our doctors and nurses because we don't produce enough of them. About 40% of our science PhDs. And it works at the low end because we don't produce farm hands and we don't produce dishwashers and we don't produce temporary seasonal workers. And you know, you hear, and unfortunately Mark Krikorian, our, our great opponent who's not here, you know, he would say, well, um, these workers are taking American jobs. The truth is that they're, because they're so different from us, either more or less educated, they don't compete with us. By and large, they complement us. And so, you know, think about a restaurant. You start a restaurant because you have the available dishwashers and busboys. Well, that allows you to hire a chef and hire a maitre d' and hire an architect complementary work. Immigrants complement us, and because they complement us, they help grow the economy. They help sustain jobs for Americans, not just that chef and that maitre d', but also the people who are growing the food, and the people, the guys who are insuring the restaurant and designing the restaurant and, and, and financing the restaurant. Um, and they make us all more productive because of the way they complement us. And that's true even in a recession. I mean, people are, you know, why are we even talking about this in a recession? Americans are still not wanting to do those jobs at the low end, and we're still not graduating enough people to do all the jobs that we're going to need, especially when the recovery starts at the high end. The New York Times did a great piece a few weeks ago where the reporter spent some time in a meatpacking plant in Tennessee, a town built around a meatpacking plant. And she, the, the emblematic guy, she chose the white guy who'd been working as a mechanic, earning $15 an hour. He'd been out of work for six months. He'd lost his truck. He'd lost his house. He'd gone home to live with his mother, but he still wasn't interested in going and doing that hard physical work on the line of cutting off the chicken's heads that immigrants are willing to do. Um, and so we're still needing immigrants in a recession. We're going to need them even more when the economy picks up and we start to want to grow the economy again. Hard to grow a business without workers. Hard to grow an economy without workers. So the problem isn't really the immigrants, and I'm coming back to my diagnosis. The problem is the law that's fighting the dynamism of the world economy. About a million and a half people come every year, pulled by supply and demand. Our, as you heard from Jeff, we give out about a million, a million point one visas. It's as if we were making cars here and had to import the steel, but our steel quotas were a third too low. I mean, how dumb would that be? And of course, it's bad for everyone. It's bad for the immigrants who have to die in the desert to get here. It's bad for American workers who are undercut when these workers are, because they're illegal, can't really bargain for their rights. It's bad for the rule of law, obviously. It's bad for border security. I'll never forget the border guard who said to me, if another 9-11 happens and it happens on my watch because I'm chasing your next busboy or my next gardener, I'll never forgive myself. Uh, and it's bad for employers who have to make a choice. Do I grow my business or do I obey the law? The only people who benefit are the smugglers. So that's the diagnosis. What's the remedy? Well, first I'll talk a little bit about my ideal remedy, and then I'll talk for, uh, briefly about the constraints that politics this year are putting on an ideal remedy. The, the ideal remedy has three pillars. The first and most important pillar is better enforcement. We've had a situation for the last 20, 30, 40 years where 
as, as another Border Patrol guard once said to me, we make the law to keep one side happy and we don't enforce it to keep the other side happy. Well, we need realistic law and we need to start to enforce it. The public is rightly fed up with a situation where the law is a, immigration law is a joke and we don't enforce it seriously. So we need realistic law and we need to enforce it, both on the border, where we need mostly more men and more technology. I think the wall is kind of a silly symbol, but we need to do it on the border and we need to do it even more important than the border, we need to do it in the workplace. Employers need to know whether the guy standing in front of them is authorized to work or not. And, you know, I don't think we can argue about the details of how you do it. I think, you know, it's as simple as really a credit card system. It's some kind of card. It's some kind of computer system where you can ping that information against a database. And it's serious penalties for the employers who don't uh, play by the rules. So that's pillar number one, enforcement. Pillar number two, we need legalization. And we need legalization not for the immigrants' sake, is not the way I see it. I see it as we need it for, for our sake as a country. The situation that we have now, we have 11, 12 million people here who aren't leaving. Uh, as, as you, people, come and, people come and go, some of the new arrived people go back after a while, but if you've been here 5, 10, 15 years, or married, have U.S. citizen children, you're not leaving. So the undocumented population isn't leaving. It's not safe for us to have a population like that, a population the size of Pennsylvania, whose names we don't know and who've never undergone a background check, and it's not good for our values. I don't want to live in a kind of country where there's a whole population like that, an underground population that's not part of the system. That's not what democracy means to me. So, you know, we can argue about this pillar about exactly what kind of hoops you make, you want to make them go through. We can, um, we can talk about, about how long you want to make them wait. Do they have to wait until the people waiting in line have already come through? You can talk about who exactly in that population. You know, we certainly don't want to give criminals legalization. We, we're going to do some kind of sorting. There are arguments to be had, but the bottom line for me is we have to have some system for those people to earn their way back in. And again, you can use whatever metaphor you want. You can use restitution. I kind of like earn. Um, and I think they should be citizens. Again, people argue, should we just legalize them? Should we make them citizens? Um, I think citizens are more consistent with our values. Do we really want a body, do we want to legalize those people but have them here not being able to vote? That's not the kind of country I see myself living in. Um, but the basic point and is, you know, I think we can't pretend they don't exist. I think we can't pretend that if we just enforce the law a little more toughly, which is what Mark Krikorian would say if he was here, that they would go away. They're not going away. We're trying to enforce the law more toughly and they're not going away. But the third pillar, I'm coming to the third pillar, and the third pillar is actually the most important in my view. Because if you think about the diagnosis and the root cause, really, of the dysfunction we have now, the root cause is that we don't have an adequate pipeline for the workers who we need to man and grow our economy to come here legally. I think the most important part of a reform is a pipeline that creates a way for the workers we need, the workers that do jobs that we don't do because we're not educated enough or too educated, to come into the country legally rather than illegally. That's the source of the problem. Uh, and I think we, we, they, we, we do have to make, again, there are things that you can argue about. Obviously, that flow, as we saw from Jeff's presentation, rises and falls with the economy. And you want to have a system that accommodates that rise and fall. You don't want to be letting too many people in in a year where we don't need those workers, but you also don't want to be choking the economy in a year when we do need those workers. We have to make sure that employers make every effort to hire Americans first. That has to be part of the law. We have to make sure that employers make every effort to treat the immigrant more than an effort, that they do succeed in treating the immigrants fairly and the way they treat American workers. Um, and we can argue about should these workers be temporary, should they be permanent, should they be actually temporary workers who can eventually become permanent if they want to, and that's actually the model that appeals most to me. I think most people do come initially on a temporary basis. They come to try out their luck, and if they succeed here, if they do well on their jobs and they move up on their jobs and they start to assimilate, those are the kind of people I'd like to reward and say, well, maybe they could stay permanently. So my ideal policy would be a policy that started out with kind of provisional workers, where people earned the right to stay. But the basic point is the pipeline needs that we need to link the quotas in a flexible, real-time way to our genuine labor needs, both at the top and the bottom of the economy. And the problem is, and I'm coming to the, to the to conclusion here, is that in the real political world we live in today, that's going to be very hard to do. Trying to make this policy in a recession, trying to make this policy in a situation where 
the labor, organized labor is going to be a very powerful voice in the debate and is hesitant about admitting more workers, especially temporary workers, is going to make adding that third leg, that leg where we, which I think is the most important leg, that leg where we create an adequate pipeline for the workers to come into the country, it's going to be hard to argue that in a recession and hard to get it in the current Washington. And that is going to be, I think, a lot of what the debate is going to be about this time. Yes, you're going to hear the talk radio people screaming amnesty and others arguing back, but a lot of the debate that's going to be new and different this time that didn't happen last time and I urge you to pay attention to and, you know, urge those of you who who care to get involved and fight for is how are we going to keep that flexible pipeline, flexible real-time reactive pipeline so that the flow in the future me meets our market needs. And you know, we made the mistake before of not doing that. The mistake that we made in 1986 was exactly this mistake. We did a, we, we, we passed a law, um, I don't know if Senator Kerry was around, um, passed a law that legalized the people already here, tried to toughen up enforcement, but didn't create a new pipeline. And what happened? Enforcement doesn't work very well when you don't have a pipeline. Remember what it was like to try to enforce prohibition, or imagine what it's like to try to stick to a 500 calorie diet? When you're when, you're, when your limits are out of sync with your real needs, it's really hard to enforce them. When you get your limits more into line with your needs, it's much more plausible to enforce them. So again, if we don't create the right kind of pipeline this time, trouble with enforcement, and trouble, the same kind of trouble we've had in the last 20 years, where at the end of a, of a five-year period, 10-year period, 20-year period, we're going to have another big pool of undocumented workers in the country. Because the, that dynamism of the market isn't going to end or stop. The country's going to start growing again. We're going to need the workers. There are going to be jobs Americans are too educated or not educated enough to do. And if we don't create a pipeline, we're, unfortunately, we're going to have people coming again illegally. And in 5, 10, 20 years, we're going to have another pool of undocumented. So, you know, it's going to be a tough debate this year. Um, I think the, the key in these immigration debates is always, it's a word I used earlier, but it's a word I've been thinking a lot more about lately, compromise. How are we going to get to the compromises we need so that this policy really does work for all Americans, business and unions, and a policy, left and right, and a policy that works, uh, a policy that delivers our security, recognizes the, mar our mar the dynamism of our markets, restores the rule of law, and, and is cons consistent with our values. Um, and in closing, I just want to leave you with an image in closing. I really think of immigration today as and globalization and immigration, which is the human face of immigration, as our era's industrial revolution. And if you think about what it would have been like to live in Europe in the middle of the industrial revolution, you know, what you would have noticed is a big ugly building on your block, um, smoke spewing into the atmosphere, and children had to work at night. You would have noticed all the nuisances and all the difficulties of introducing the Industrial Revolution, and you probably wouldn't have seen, well, this is going to introduce a new standard of living for me and my children and future generations. And I think what we're seeing with immigration is in many ways like that. We see the nuisances, we don't necessarily see the benefits, and we don't realize that as with the Industrial Revolution, it's probably going to take a, you know, decades, if not hundreds of years, to figure out how to make that globalization to to to, to um, sand off the rough edges, like the spewing smoke and the children working at night, so that the for, that the that the new phenomenon really works for us. Um, that's what we're trying to do in Washington as we make these laws. Um, we're about to have another debate where we try to figure out how to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, like Tamar, um, I'm uh, a little bit sorry that, that Mark Recording couldn't join us tonight because we, I think, would have put into very sh stark relief uh, uh, two perhaps diametrically opposed visions of what uh, immigration means for this country. Um, I think as Tamar uh, has laid out, and as I, I, and I would definitely agree with her, I, I view immigration as a source of great vitality and dynamism, and Mark and his colleagues view immigration as something to end. Um, last tonight, you only get the right view, um, or, or the left, as it were. Um, the need for reform, uh, based on what uh, Tamara laid out, based on 
uh, what Mr. Aids laid out based on uh, Jeffrey's uh, excellent presentation, I think is undisputable. Um, but I'll, I'll just sum it up from my perspective. We've got 12 million reasons to fix our broken immigration system. Um, it's economically and morally unacceptable to have, for the, for the richest country in the history of the planet, to have 5% of its workforce living and working in the shadows. Uh, the, the shining city on a hill uh, is casting quite a large shadow right now over a class of workers who are potentially subject to exploitation and definitely living in a uh, very marginal existence in this, this country. As Jeff noted, we've got millions of these workers who are living in mixed families. They're living with U.S. citizens. They've got U.S. citizen children and spouses in some cases, and uh, they are terrified of being torn apart and what that would mean for their families. Um, yes, it's true. It's a marginal existence that was, in some respects, brought upon themselves. Uh, in some instances, uh, it wasn't with the kids, but, but for the most part, yes, it was a decision, a conscious choice that they made. But think about it. What kind of choice was it really between two very unpalatable alternatives? They, they had the choice to remain at home and uh, basically lose hope for improving their lot in many of these countries or take a risk and try to scrape and claw like uh, most of our forefathers did uh, for a better opportunity. Um, this is the land that has always promised opportunity, and it is and will remain a beacon of opportunity and, uh, and a magnet for, for that. So as Tamar laid out, I, I think the, the notion that we're going to, uh, you know, Tamar's looking at it more from, I think, the, um, the, the demand perspective, but there is also the supply perspective. Um, these people are making um, very conscious decisions, but they're decisions that, that we need to understand, uh, be empathic towards and compassionate towards. Unfortunately, I think Mark and uh, his colleagues uh, lack a little bit of, of, of that compassion, and it, it hurts the, the quality of the debate right now. Um, their, their position, the, the position of immigration restrictionists, uh, and, and unfortunately, it's been a, a very powerful position in, in D.C., uh, where Tamara and I have been uh, trying to, to push for progressive reforms, is, is uh, one that um, does not even acknowledge that there is, that we do have broken laws. What, what they believe, as also Tamara laid out, was that they think we just need to enforce the laws that we currently have on the books. Um, they, they, they now claim that they don't believe in mass deportation, um, but that they support a strategy called attrition. It's attrition through the comprehensive enforcement of the laws on the books. But uh, mass deportation and attrition are uh, a, a distinction without a difference. They're both morally um, bankrupt, and they are not going to advance uh, the basic interests of, of our nation. Now, we have a historic opportunity this year historic opportunity to do something very different than pursue a policy of mass deportation or attrition. Uh, we've got an opportunity to overhaul our immigration laws, uh, to bring them into the 21st century, um, to serve both our interests, regional interests, um, but, but also the interests, uh, not only our economic interests, but the, the interests of our values as a, as a nation of, of immigrants. And um, I, I don't think that we get... We, we end up descending too often, I think, into a, uh, a, a very, uh, um, you know, oppositional debate here. But w we really need to, and I, and I, I commend uh, President Kerry for having this event, because we really need to find common ground. I, I think the American people are looking for common ground. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's the advocates who are either trying to push for uh, reform or stop reform um, that are ending up polarizing the debate. So it's important to continue to have these dialogues. Um, let me briefly sketch out why I think we have a real opportunity to overhaul our immigration laws this year. Um, and, and an overhaul would include essentially all of the things that Tamar said. Um, we have got to um, create a, a mechanism for the undocumented population to come out of the shadows, register, pay a fine, pay their taxes, uh, get to the back of the line, um, but get on a path to citizenship. Um, we also need to reunite families. Some families are 
uh, divided uh, just in terms of the statutory backlogs. Uh, it's not, this isn't a processing issue for, for um, Mike Gates. It's, this is a, a, a legal issue. This is the, uh, the, the problem with our immigration laws. Um, sometimes they're divided for 20 years at a time. Um, you know, how, who's going to really wait 20 years to be reunited with their loved ones? Uh, not, I certainly wouldn't. I, I know the decision that I would probably make if I was uh, standing in their shoes, and it's something that we always need to remind ourselves. Um, but it will also strengthen our employment verification regime. As Tamar said, we need to, employers need to know that the person who's standing in front of them um, is authorized to work in this country. And, and right now, um, they don't have uh, the ability to do that. Um, and, and finally, we really need to overhaul our employment-based immigration system. Um, right now, we've got, you know, in, in terms of the high-skilled immigration, uh, we've got these artificial caps that are hit on the first day of the, the, um, the filing period almost every year. This year's an exception because of uh, the, the soured economy. Uh, but we don't have any path um, for the low-skilled immigrants to come into this country other than in a seasonal way. So uh, we really need to um, take a, a close look at our uh, employment-based immigration system. Um, but let me just sketch out why I think we've got an opportunity to make those types of major reforms. And, and we've you know, been fighting this fight for many years now, and um, I, I, I do think that uh, we've, we've got a, a new dynamic to, to work with this year. Uh, it, it really f goes back to that fateful day in November uh, when um, uh, the, the new Congress and the new president were elected. Uh, November 4th was a game changer for this issue. It blew open some political space that had been constricted uh, uh, in, in the 2007 debates um, to the point of suffocating the, the, the ability of the issue to even go forward, even though I, I'd say a great majority of Americans wanted to see uh, Congress uh, step up and solve this problem. Um, and and, and here's, here's why it was a game changer. The Latino and immigrant community votes uh, on, on November 4th were uh, record-breaking. Um, the Latino vote was 3,000, uh, three, excuse me, 3 million more than uh, the, their turnout in 2004, and it was double their turnout from 2000. Um, those are seismic demographic upheavals when you're talking about 9% of uh, the, the voting electorate um, having doubled its size, and we're only going to see a continuation of, uh, of those demographic changes over the next several election cycles. Um, so, th so that's for starters. Ominously, I think for Republicans, uh, the Latino vote and the immigrant vote at large uh, broke overwhelmingly for the Democrats. Um, and you know, there's a lot of, I also wish Mark was here to uh, play foil on this issue, but um, there are a lot of uh, different uh, disputes about why that happened. Was it just because there was just a wave of people going towards Democrats? And there, there is no explanation for um, the numeric changes that, that occurred between 2004 and 2008, especially when you had a candidate at the top of the ticket in John McCain who was extremely well-respected, extremely well-liked, and well-known in the immigrant community. Um, not, and not only was the, the immigrant vote, in particular the Latino vote, um, the, the largest demographic shift in the, in the uh, 2008 elections, it was also the decisive factor in changing the electoral map um, by uh, delivering Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, Florida, and making a difference in um, three other swing states, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, and Indiana. So. Um, it was, um, I think, a huge wake-up call to uh, the, the politicians in D.C. who had been wondering if that sleeping giant was ever going to awake. Um, and, and what's more, uh, anti-immigrant candidates lost overwhelmingly in the polls, at the polls in, in 2004. In 20 out of 22 uh, toss-up races, the pro-immigration reform candidate defeated the hardliner enforcement-only candidate. That is a, that's a you know, pretty stunning and uh, very consistent with the last two election cycles uh, uh, statement or indictment of um, the use of immigration as a, a wedge issue by immigration hardliners. And I think the, the lessons for both parties are pretty clear. Um, you know, when you look at all of this demographic data, and, and um, it's, you know, some of this is still coming out, but 
Um, and there is a lot of polling that's being done. Tamara's done, her, her organization in the past has done some polling. There is a lot of polling that is um, uh, actually in the field right now. But, um, you know, I think what the, the Republicans need to understand is that it's time to sue for peace with the Latinos. They better come with something more than a, a deportation only um, or a, uh, you know, an attrition um, uh, through enforcement strategy if they I expect to, to not be consigned to minority status for a generation. But, but for the Democrats, they've also got a challenge. I mean, the onus is on them right now. They are in control. They, they have the White House and they have Congress. And uh, the immigrant communities are expecting them to act on their priorities. And immigration reform is plainly one of uh, their, their priorities. And uh, so it, it's really going to be up to them to see how they respond and, and, and whether they can deliver. The, the comments from uh, the president in the last uh, two months have been very promising, um, and, and I think they're indicative of uh, the fact that we are going to have a fight later this fall. Um, I, I would also just point out that this is not simply... Um, you know, they have the, the Democrats and or Republicans have to respond to, you know, a, a particular interest group here. I guess it's 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 a demographic group, the uh, the, the immigrant vote. Um, the American public at large and independents in particular um, voiced in, in both in the 2008 elections and in the 2006 elections um, an, an incredibly strong bias towards solutions. They want this Congress and, and this president to step up and solve tough problems. Uh, that, more than anything, was uh, the one takeaway that, that all of the post-election analysis and polling done by, I, I think, pollsters on both sides of the aisle uh, turned up. So um, what does that mean for immigration? Well, for immigration, um, and, and you know, Tamar knows this well because this is about, we've got about three years now of consistent polling on this. For immigration, uh, we have seen that the majority of the public, almost two-thirds on average of the public, and this is Democrats, Republicans, independents, support a comprehensive solution to this problem. They do not support enforcement only. They support legalize, requiring the current undocumented population to get legal, pay taxes, go to the back of the line, but they also, um, uh, you know, at the same time, they, don't, they are not um, uh, punitive in the sense that they, they want to see them pay extraordinary fines that are going to make it, it, it totally unworkable. What, they, what we've seen is, is that pragmatism clearly beats uh, restrictionist ideology in the court of public opinion. Um, let me just quickly, because uh, I, I know we want to have plenty of time for Q&A, and, and I think we're coming up on the end of my 10 minutes if, if I haven't already gone over, but I just want to quickly tackle two somewhat interrelated questions that, that have been coming up um, in the media, they've been coming up in our uh, meetings on the Hill, and, and they are that, uh, the, the one is, can we really do immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform in this economy? And, and the related question is, is um, given the current economic environment, should, shouldn't we maybe be looking at doing bite-sized pieces of this or rather than trying to swallow the whole enchilada? Um, I think first and foremost on the economic argument, uh, what we found, um, not, only, not only does it make good policy sense, but uh, I think the American public understands this. Um, immigration reform must occur because of, not in spite of, the economy. Um, real immigration reform will promote, not hinder, economic growth. Uh, it will level the playing field for all workers and employers. This isn't just about the workers. This isn't just about the immigrants. This is about their American, their U.S. counterparts. This is about leveling the playing field for the U.S. employers who are trying to play by the rules. Um, by, by, by taking the trap door out of the, the bottom end of the wage scale and legalizing um, these, work, these workers, uh, you're, you're going to be able to have that opportunity to, to level the playing field. But just also, and, and uh, you know, we didn't plan to be echoing each other like this so much, but I, I, I do, um, I think we see a lot of, uh, we see eye to eye on a lot of this. Reforming the legal immigration channels um, is not something that is, um, you know, so just for the, 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 the future. Um, it's going to protect U.S. workers against the type of exploitation that can occur when you've got an undocumented workforce. 
um, improving legal immigration channels. It will also restore America as the, the preeminent destination for high-skilled, for the, the best and the brightest. Um, we're starting to see some slippage there, and, and it's because uh, we've got some deeply flawed immigration policies with respect to high-skilled immigrants. Um, everyone looks at this issue through the, the prism of self-interest, and that's U.S. workers, U.S. employers, and you, me, and um, everyone on this panel. Uh, but but the, I think the, the average honest um, employer and the average honest U.S. worker, all they want is to be able to compete on a level playing field. And when we've got 1 in 20 workers who are undocumented, um, you can't have that level playing field. It's impossible. Uh, the American public wants everyone to pay their taxes. They want um, the government to control the border. And right now they don't have confidence in either of those, those uh, desires. Um, the, the most interesting piece of uh, polling that's come out recently, and, and I'm just about to close, uh, is that uh, about, by about a two to one margin, even um, when you frame the question in purely economic terms, a two to one margin, um, Americans believe that requiring undocumented workers to get legal and pay taxes is a preferable alternative to requiring undocumented workers, seven million undocumented workers, to up and leave the United States. Finally, um, on the piecemeal versus um, comprehensive question, the, the, the goal here is restoring the foundation of legality to the immigration system so that we can build a 21st century immigration program. Um, and if you try to start doing bits and pieces of this, uh, it, you know, you lose the speed that Mike talked about. You know, you need to do this in rapid fire um, succession. You can't have this dragged out over a long period of time because you're gonna have more people coming in. You're gonna have more dysfunction building. But right now, um, uh, the only game in town in D.C. is comprehensive. There's, there's a political reason for it, and uh, there's a policy reason why, why you want to do it this way. So, um, the, you know, the question can be asked, but, but it, there's a pretty clear answer that um, for, for policy and for politics, we've got to have a comprehensive solution. We are going to go ahead and run a little bit over, run to, to a quarter to, to eight. Uh, and I think the cards have been passed out. If, if, if they haven't been passed out, I, I could also take them from the audience. But if, if, just to set it, because uh, Alec uh, and I are going to try to, and with a limited amount of time, co-moderate this a bit. But um, I, I heard uh, a lot of, uh, Secretary Tamar, uh, talking about the need for compromise. And, I, and then uh, uh, Marshall, uh, 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 I think took on the idea of a scaled down piece of legislation. Um, but just looking at the landscape, the political landscape, with labor saying we'll support it so long as there isn't a guest worker program, business saying we'll support it so long as there is a guest worker program. Uh, if you're trying to figure out how to get, uh, I would say, I don't think this is going to go in a reconciliation bill, so it's, you got to get, you got to get to 60 votes in the Senate. Uh, and. Uh, so, and, and particularly given the administrative workload, I mean, in 86, we processed 3 million, uh, maybe not quite 3 million, because I'm not sure we, and not everybody applied for it. So whatever the number was, it's a, it's a, uh, it, you have to think about how you're going to process whatever the requirements are, whatever the upfront requirements are, and there will be upfront requirements that create additional regulatory friction. Why not come and say, take, let's, let's, let's take the 30, or I'm just, Ask Jeffrey how many people, how many undocumented have been here over 10 years. Why not take that 30 to 40 percent of the population uh, uh, first? Uh, uh, why not do a scaled-down bill? At least get something done. Because I, 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 what I fear is that, that the, the case for a, a comprehensive piece of, piece of legislation uh, is, uh, I think it's gonna, is going to be exceptionally difficult. Uh, so why not take a scale down that drops the guest worker program and then just tries to provide uh, some administrative possibilities for people who have been here uh, more than 10 years? 
Can, can I take a stab at an answer? Yeah. Because, um, because I think Congress won't come back to that third piece. The third piece is in many ways as hard as the legalization or the quote unquote amnesty is politically unpopular as that is, there's a strong constituency for that. To create that new pipeline, that's a harder case to make to the public. That's, that's going to be one of the actually hardest pieces for Congress to well, do. But tomorrow, and the it, hardest piece is going to get people to call a guest worker program a pipeline. If they're going to call it a guest worker program, and, and they do feel like that guest worker program has a negative impact on their employment opportunities. Right. So if you do the legalization and you do enforcement, Congress will never come back to the other piece. Congress, That's the danger. I, I, I got bad news for you. Congress comes back every single year. Um, so, uh, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Alec, do you, have a, do you want to throw a question? I, I have a couple questions. I, I, I have... Um, is this on? Can everyone hear me? Okay, so I have um, two questions I'd love to get out on the table, but I'll start with one and see where we go. Um, so um, I, I want to start by saying that I agree with almost all of what Marshall and Tamar said, um, except one thing. Uh, and so since Mark Krikorian's not here, I'm going to do my best to stir the pot, which often seems to be my... A role as an educator at the new school. So, um, so I, uh, you know, particularly along the lines of if I put on my economist hat, I certainly agree that immigration workers raise productivity and lower costs for the general population. Um, but the question of if they lead to lower employment among the poor and lower middle class, I don't think is as settled as you stated. Um, whether or not we can. You know, George Borjas, who wrote the book Heaven's Door and is a Harvard economist who I respect but have also grown to find that he's anti-immigrant, pretty much, uh, makes, however, a fairly strong argument that if there's, you know, along the lines of no pain, no gain, or no free lunch, or can't have your cake and eat it too, you know, basically in the immigration uh, world, it's if there's no cost to U.S. workers, it's not really possible that we can also have an immigration bonus, right? And so I understand why, uh, you know, it's important to play up the potential for economic productivity gains and also, you know, it's nice, you know, the idea of a chef gets a job because of, a, uh, because of increased um, uh, low-wage immigration, but it's... I, I'd like to push you a little bit on the whether we can really, you know, we're not lobbying Washington now, so we're just in the safe part, and everyone, no one will talk. Don't worry. You know, can we really have our cake and eat it too on this? And there, there seems to be some evidence from my field that there really is a cost to U.S. workers. Leveling the playing field will go some, but that... Um, you know, and I don't know what the answer is. I mean, Borjas argues to change the legal entry requirements from a family-based to an economic productivity base like uh, the Canadian point system. And that's sort of another area maybe where I'm hearing a little bit of, you know, have your cake and eat it too. Can you really pursue at the same time a family-based policy like we basically have for legal immigration where we prioritize reuniting families and at the same time also pursue, you know, high-end, high-skilled jobs that um, will gain productivity um, at the same time. I'll, I'll just take part of that and Tamar can answer, maybe you can answer on the point system as well, which is, I think, enormously problematic and hasn't been very successful. And, places like Canada, uh, but, but you're right um, in, 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 at one level. Um, on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, the, the low-wage jobs um, which, for which we haven't seen any um, you know, wage increases over you know, several decades now, uh, kind of real wage increases, uh, there, there may be a slight negative effect um, if there is any effect, it's very slight and negative. Borjas is, I think, completely overstates that case, and there's been a lot of much more nuanced research that, that, that bears that out um, by some of our colleagues at the Immigration Policy Center as well. But, uh, but overall, I think 
economists across the board believe that the net effect of immigration uh, is positive. And, and so, yes, there, there is some impact, and, and it should not be taken lightly, and, and we need to address, um, I think, the, the low-wage workforce in this country, and we need to address the fact that 10 percent of the population still is dropping out of high school and um, going into these jobs. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't think any of, us want, any of us want to gloss that fact. Um, it's just that, you know, we can't do everything in this, uh, this bill, and, um, and certainly I think the fact that, uh, that there is a fairly united labor position on this shows that, that they understand um, that, that unless, you, unless and until you uh, create a, a level playing field for uh, the, the workforce at that level, that there is going to be um, more, there will be more uh, there will be less opportunity to try to lift all of um, uh, the, the wages at, at the bottom end of the wage scale. And if I can just put a couple of numbers to that. Marshall and I do actually disagree about some things. I mean, we, we could try to look for what we disagree about. We're not doing a very good job of disagreeing here. Um, but, I mean, yes, of course, that's a, the, the effect at the very low end is a problem, and we do need to address the problem, why do people still drop out of high school? Why do people, um, why is there a segment of the America where the work ethic is still a problem? But just to put the, some numbers to it, um, we're talking about the, the, the American workers who immigrants compete with, it's less than 10% of the workforce. Um, they do tend to be people of color and other um, immigrants who've been here a little bit longer, but it's less than 10%. And the wage affects Borjas's number, and Borjas is the guy who says it's the worst. He says that over 20 years, there was a 5% effect <clears throat> excuse me, on the wages of that workforce, 5% over 20 years. And other economists who study it say it's probably more like 1% to 2% over 20 years. So it's not that it's nothing, but it's a small part of the workforce and it's a small effect. And the question is, how do we, what can we do for that part of the native-born workforce to help make them more competitive that I think is not a, something that the immigration bill can do that's about larger changes in society. But I just want to, I want to, it's not just high-skilled immigrants that make us more productive. It's, 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 you know, it's because women can go into the, it's because they're fast food restaurants that are mostly, um, where mostly immigrants are working that women are going into the workforce. Um, so it's not, it's a mistake to just think it's just the brain surgeon um, or, or, or the inventor who's making us more productive. Mark Krikorian, you know, poor Mark Krikorian who's not here, he likes to say to me on TV, um, there Tamar goes again. This is one of his, you know, better lines. He says, Tamar thinks that the solution to the American economy is to import a class of high High school dropouts, and I actually cop to that. I mean, I think high school dropouts, because they do work that we mostly don't do, do make us more productive. I, I agree with the added productivity at the low end, certainly, because um, you know, if you're lowering construction costs, lowering the cost of eating in a, a restaurant, I mean, lowering costs with you know, and and not hurting benefits, that's an increase in productivity right there. So, you know, definitely, definitely agree. Can, can you, there's, a, there's a, a lot of questions and all of them good coming from the audience and I'm, I'm gonna try to uh, sort a bit here to, uh, to get it done, but there's a number of questions that are, that, uh, that are sort of like the one that I was asking, uh, which is, uh, can you take a particular piece of the population, uh, children who are citizens who have at least one, uh, or, uh, one parent, uh, uh, and, and deal with those on a, on a, on a you know, not just a test case, but there are real administrative challenges here. And uh, there, there's, uh, you know, that, that, that I think you have to face honestly. So there's a number of questions trying to uh, address that. And then a number of questions uh, that are, are centered on this, uh, the, the, you know, are, there, are there larger forces here? Uh, trade policies, for example, and other policies that might have an impact, as well as uh, questions about whether or not we ought to be, if, if such a large fraction, even though it's smaller than I think most people think, coming out of Mexico, do we need to direct some of our attention to the relatively low level investment that, Mex that the Mexican government makes uh, in its own people and its own job creation? Is that part of, uh, should that be part of our, uh, uh, our diplomatic strategy at least? I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get all these cards, so I threw about six uh, questions out to all of you. I'll, I'll t oh, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Can, let, me, let me just put a number or two on this and, and, and give some context, uh, particularly about Mexico. Um, I think there are a lot of people who've argued for many years that Mexico 
is a special case and, and that we need uh, to look more directly at policy solutions uh, in immigration dealing with Mexico. <clears throat> there are uh, almost 13 million Mexicans in the United States now. Uh, and if, if you kind of look at this demographically and look at the kids that they've had here, who if they hadn't come, they would have had them back in Mexico. Uh, basically, about one out of nine Mexicans in the world is in the United States, between one and nine and one and 10 is in the United States. And if we think of their US born children who are US citizens, but also have a right to Mexican citizenship, it's more like one in six. So that, that seems to me as, uh, uh, there are other countries where we have large fractions of the people, but nowhere near the numbers. And, and it's- But, but, but Jeff, I mean, the, 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 what, what, I mean, I, I understand why somebody in Mexico say, I'm gonna cross the border and work in Texas, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, but they're going to Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, uh, well, I mean, what, what, what's, what's producing uh, this need to leave? It seems to me. Well, so. I know I, I, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm exactly saying that. What we've done over the last uh, 15 years is the, the, uh, the migration streams have matured in some places and we've developed new ones because there were opportunities in the U.S. And as Tamar said, the cell phone, you know, the, the guy who got to Iowa and found a job there can call his cousin and say, hey, this is a good job here. Right. Uh, and um, it's, it's become an integrated population, an integrated market that uh, seems to me it cries out for exactly the things you're talking about, more attention to me what's going on in Mexico. Uh, uh, and the diaspora here will undoubtedly play a role in that as we go forward. But, but the point is, I mean, we do of course need more policies to help Mexico, I mean, we and the Mexican government need to help Mexican development for all kinds of reasons that, that matter to us, to have a, 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 a prosperous and democratic country next to us. But if Mexico became Switzerland overnight, we would still need the workers. It's not, people go to Duluth, not because people go to Duluth because there's work to be done in Duluth that Americans aren't doing because they're either not educated enough or too educated to do. It's the, the demand will continue even after we, um, even after Mexico catches up with us in, 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 in status. Well, let me add to that for a moment. That's probably true to a great extent. And there are certainly issues in Mexico that probably drive some people to leave. But you could take any third world country and you could glue them to a land border to the United States. And if that's where the job opportunities are and people are able to cross far more freely than they are and when they have to get on an airplane after getting a visa or get on a boat and find a way here, you're gonna have the same situation. You know, you've, you all have said it in different ways, but it comes down to the fact that immigration is largely an economically driven phenomena. And unless immigration law However you decide to solve that third piece, unless immigration policy deals with the economic drivers and recognizes that there have to be certain advantages in a system that are built to advantage American workers in that process, you're gonna end up with a skewed result. And um, I just wanna, Mike said this earlier, but I wanna think it's important to keep in mind uh, we can talk about different pieces of this population, but uh, my own sense is it will be an administrative nightmare to, 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 it, to, to actually run a program that says, well, if you've had a kid here, you get treatment A. Uh, if you came in before a certain date, you get treatment B. If you came in after that, you get treatment C. Um, but those, no. those, those dividing lines are in the comprehensive bill. Uh, they're in the comprehensive legislation That's right now. It's not his job. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a question of, in fact, there's more than that. There's language requirements. There's all sorts of things. There's the all bill. sorts of complexity in mm -hmm. the bill that was discussed back then. And, and what I was simply suggesting to you all is if, not when, if the Congress <laughs> and the White House decide that they want to do something substantive in this area, 
with respect to these 11.9 million folks, you know, the answer to a successful program is simplicity. It has to be effective, it has to be enforceable, but it has to be relatively simple. You can, if there's complexity, the complexity needs to be in the pathway forward that moves them to residency with what speed, with what hurdles they have to cross. Not with the complexity of trying to, as you're dealing with the challenge of 11.9 million people, all at the same time, trying to go through a sorting process like Hogwarts Academy and try and figure out what house they all need to go into. You can take the time and do that later on after you've dealt with that first preliminary challenge. Can, can I get the patent? There's, yeah. there's a whole bunch of questions here from people that are asking what can they do? Uh, uh, how can they influence the legislation? And, and I mean, I, I, I'll set the, uh, this, what I tried to do earlier. I mean, there, if, if just, from the, just from the narrow vantage of, of, of university issues, I mean, I would love to see the law say, you know, if you, get a, if you walk across a, a, a stage and get a diploma, we had to staple a green card to it instead of saying you got to go home. Uh, 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 we have uh, uh, international students who come here on a student visa, and they're told they can't work. They have to work within a certain radius of, 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 of the physical property of the university. So we have, but, but the question for me is, if neither of those are in the bill, would I still support it? That's what it gets down to. That's why I focus on the guest worker issue, because my own view is if it's in, you don't get 60 votes, and if it's out, you don't get 60 votes right now. And somebody's going to have to give in order to get 60 votes, because it's either going to be in or out. Uh, those are the only two choices. And right now, there's, there's, a, there's a group that will mobilize to prevent you get from getting 60, uh, 60 votes if it's in, and a group that will mobilize to uh, 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 prevent you from getting 60 votes if it's out. Well, but I think we're going to look for a, <laughs> for a compromise where we're going to try well, to, I mean, my idea of a compromise would be where you create some kind of pipeline for workers to come in the future, but it's closed now because we don't need workers now, but there are some mechanisms that could potentially open that, comp that pipeline going forward. I mean, I, you know, it's, it, and you never want when you're playing a legislative game to say to anybody, and certainly not into a microphone, what you're willing to compromise on. <laughs> Right. I'm, at the moment, I'm saying, you know, it has to be a pipeline, but uh, there are obviously going to be compromises where but, we're going to figure but, out, is there a pipeline that you can open and but, close? But continue talking about that, because I'm, I'm, I was setting it only, not because I was trying to declare what my position is, except on the issue of how, the issues that affect higher education, but isn't, isn't it what, what citizens have to do is decide uh, what they're willing to support if it doesn't have something in there that they really want? I mean, where do you, I mean what compromise are you willing to accept? And uh, uh, before you ever get into the question of how, how then will I influence the, the political debate, it seems to me that citizens have to make a decision about uh, what would they do if something that they care deeply about is not in the bill. Well, I urge citizens, what I would just say to, um, it's thrilling to be in an audience where people are handing in cards saying, what can I do? Um, there are lots of ways you can get involved. It's about keeping pressure on your congressman. My organization is designed to put pressure on um, center-right members of Congress, um, conservative Democrats and Republicans who we might get, because that's, I think those are the hardest votes to bring to the table. And if you're interested in getting involved or being part of that, you know, find me. If you're interested in having uh, a role where you're putting more pressure on progressive um, Senators and members of Congress, their organizations for that. But I mean, if you you know, politics is not a spectator sport. And if you care about this, um, the, what happened last time was that the people who didn't want a bill passed um, sent more than two million faxes and phone calls when the bill was on the floor. So many that they shut down the Senate switchboard. They're not a majority of the public. Every poll shows they're about 20 to 25 percent of the public are the oh people who God. really don't want this to happen. But because they're much <laughs> better organized and much more emotional, they dominated the debate. So tomorrow, if you are interested, we need... The, ten, tomorrow there voices. aren't 10% of federal elections that are decided in margins in excess of 20%. So well, if you say there's only 20, 20 to 25%, that's enough to defeat uh, almost every single member of Congress is up for election. <laughs> well, but, no, but, the, but the point is if the people who, if the people on the other side got as involved, 
you know, you go into Senate offices, and this happens to me every week. You go into a Senate office, and there's a stack of mail on the table, and you know, I've been, it can be this high. And they'll say, that's the mail we got in the last 30 days saying don't pass immigration reform. And they'll point to a bare place on the table and say, that's the stack that, get, that we got saying do pass immigration reform. So get involved, write those letters, send those faxes. So, so one thing you can do in terms of getting involved as well is uh, there, there's going to be a, a campaign, a national campaign that's getting rolled out over the next several weeks called uh, Reform Immigration for America. Uh, you'll be hearing and seeing more about it. And uh, there, the part of that effort is to do just what Tamara is saying. Um, it's to, to balance out some, no one believes these guys, the, the restrictionists have been organizing and developing their grassroots strategy and their ability to flood uh, members' offices, uh, their phone lines and their, their fax machines for like 15 years now. And we're not going to catch up in one election cycle. Um, but there is a very, very concerted effort to try to uh, mobilize a much wider group of people um, who can, you know, at least uh, provide some cover to those uh, members of Congress who want to do the right thing or want to want to vote the right way, but are confronted with the three binders of of anti-immigrant, you know, anti-reform mail, uh, and, and only have a few calls to point to on, on the other side. And already we're seeing it pay some dividends. Um, the, the the organization of mobiliz mobilization that's already occurred. Um, has allowed for, uh, e even in a few kind of test cases, uh, including with one of your, um, uh, your, your senators, uh, Senator Gillibrand, we've been really trying to, Gillibrand, we've been trying to uh, really bolster her position because she's taking a much more uh, progressive stance than she did as, as a, a congresswoman. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, but Marshall, the language that Marshall's using, he has to use when he's, when he's doing his job. But I would advise you, if you're trying to accomplish something, don't call somebody who has concerns about comprehensive reform a restrictionist, because they're calling, they're calling you know, sort of uh, moderate to pro-immigration people. They're calling us uh, uh, pro-amnesty, anti I mean, they're, they're labeling us up with, with bad things as well. So if you're trying to find middle ground, I, my, my own uh, experience with this, it's very difficult to find middle ground if you begin with a label that, that, that carries a bit of an insult with it. I, I would I, I very much agree with you, uh, President <coughs> Kerry, except that what we do know is that the people who are um, really activated on the other side and the ones who are flooding the, the offices with calls, they're not doing it with um, nice calls saying, oh, we don't think this is good for America right now. They're doing it with very venomous, um, angry, and you know, there is a lot of hate that's, that's uh, spewing well, I, from I, I, this. I'm very much aware of that. I'm just saying I don't think the antidote to it is hateful, venomous language. That's I, 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 no, but I, mean, I don't I, think a restriction, I don't think the word restrictionist is hateful and right. venomous. I just think it, it, it doesn't accurately describe uh, the, the, the moderate to conservative Republicans and Democrats that you're going to try to... Absolutely. That's, that's, that's true. So, Bob, let me ask a, a, a few... Um, questions also that came from the audience and um, I, does the, do the panelists have their pens out because now Alec I'm you're gonna, gonna have to hope that you you have to both get the questions and the answers and inside the inside of five minute envelope. I think I think I can ask the question a minute and a half and then <laughs> the, 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 uh, so that I, I mean what I want to first put out is that you know to try and broaden some of these questions that have been asked and put them in context is I think that we have um, you know, talked about the problems with the law, but actually, well, from what I hear on the panel, I'm not sure we've actually gone far enough. I mean, I would say that um, the U.S., it's hard to find a set of policies and laws that are more hypocritical and, you know, contradictory than the combination of immigration laws and policies and their enforcement. Possibly U.S. trade policy, but that's for another... <laughs> Uh, but that's for another debate. So I would sort of put that out there. I mean, you know, there's countless examples of, you know, anyone who's ever eaten in a restaurant and has supported an illegal immigrant, anyone who ever's eaten a piece of fresh fruit or, uh, or fresh produce has, has supported in illegal immigrants. But if you don't have a middleman, uh, in other words, the restaurant owner or the contractor, um, you, you can't be a cabinet member. So if you've paid them nanny directly or a housekeeper directly, you can't be a cabinet member. Um, 
Uh, one, when I was doing my research, one prominent immigration lawyer described what was the INS as um, uh, an organization that was designed not to find approximately 8 to 12 million people unless you work in the chicken industry or cleaning Walmart stores. Um, so with that as a context, uh, let me throw out some questions from the audience that um, I believe are related. Um, so to Michael, is the DHS the optimal bureaucratic institution for immigration services? Why yes or no? Um, Boy, that's all, a kind of loaded question. The uh, optimal it, bureaucratic... Well, you, you can inter interpret it however you want. Um, also for you, there's a question from the audience about what standards or measures are put in place to ensure, or could be, the integrity of the immigration process such as the adjustment status of a spouse being sponsored by a U.S. citizen. And also related to that was a question for Tamar, but I think could be really for the whole panel, which is how does our current bro broken immigration system compare to that of earlier periods of immigration? Has it always been broken, or was there a time where it worked well? And and do you beat your wife? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me take a quick stab at the, at the first question. I've been with INS for my entire career. Immigration is, is a tremendously interesting phenomenon. I refuse to f admit that I can't fix this agency. I like being in DHS. I like being in DHS for a couple of reasons. One, it keeps an umbrella together over the immigration-related agencies, ICBP and INS, and there does need to be a level of policy coordination. But I also like being in DHS because we would, get Michael, the, would, would you unwrap the acronym for us? CBP, Custom, uh, Customs and Border Patrol, and ICE is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. CBP handles the border, ICE handles interior enforcement. There needs to be close coordination. They don't need to be in one agency, but they need to work together. And being in the same cabinet, uh, ensures that. The other reason why I like being in DHS is we get the attention of the secretary of our agency far more than we were able to do, you know, within what was that amalgam of INS uh, with, with our own commissioner or with the attorney general. Structurally, we are able to really get uh, some assistance in dealing with some, you know, very crucial issues uh, that I think are important to our ability to provide the level of service uh, and administer the immigration law that we're charged with. You do, have, on the other hand, have uh, 88 committees and subcommittees to which the secretary <laughs> has to report to Congress. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm painfully aware. <laughs> Well, I guess we're coming to a close, and so I, I guess I'll take the historical question. And you get to do the last. See, oh, I'm answer. the last word, you indeed. You are okay. the last word. Okay. Well, let's see if I can say something something intelligent as they build this um, <laughs> panel. Um, intelligent reform. Um, the system has not been broken in the way it's broken now in the past um, because we didn't really have a system until until the, the 20s. There were some restrictionist laws applying to Asians in the 1880s, but until the 1920s, there really were very few restrictions. And so there was, so there was we didn't have the situation where the flow was so out of sync with what our quotas were, because we didn't have that many quotas. Then in the 20s, and th th in the, starting with the 20s, we did have a very, really, but it's not a word I use often, but a racist quota system, bigoted quota system. But the but the flow dropped off um, as soon as the depression started, and then through the through the Second World War. So the situation we have now, where our demographic um, realities are generating such a flow, and it's such at odds with the quotas. That's that's I don't know if it's brand new, but it's new on this scale. That's the challenge. Um, it's a, it's a, it's the challenge. I would argue, you know, of our, one of the biggest challenges of our day is to get that right because that flow, no matter what happens in Mexico, no matter what happens in other countries, unless we stop growing or unless people stop graduating from high school, we're going to need those immigrants, and we ought to figure out how to get a system that's in line with the economic dynamism of the world, not fighting it. I think it's a good closing statement. I, I want to apologize for everyone who wrote terrific questions. There, there's a whole stack of them here, and I, we simply did not have uh, time to get to them, and I very much apologize because it, uh, we could have gone up, I think, if you had been willing to stay here for another couple of hours. I want to thank you all for coming and for, for staying and for, for the panel. <laughs>